music is going. Let's switch over here and say, Hi, I'm Bob Doyle, the information philosopher, coming to you from my ITV studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and webcasting about my work in information philosophy. Today's subject is going to be chance in philosophy, physics, biology, psychology, and neuroscience. And let's see, I'm having a bit of technical problem as I did yesterday, so if you'll give me a minute, I'm gonna to try to start my recording system. Uh, and it's refusing to start, and it's refusing in various ways. So I'm going to just uh, re restart it, re uh, refresh the browser, waiting for coreteradec.com. See if this gives us any help. Um, it's apropos that uh, the topic for our lecture today is chance because there's a good deal of chance involved in whether I can get my program to start working. Uh, so perhaps I should um, uh, talk to you a little bit about the uh, technology that I've designed here uh, and um, hope to be able to use it regularly, five days a week, to lecture about information philosophy. Um, at least I can see that my connection to CCTV is working. And let's see whether this uh, has, has done anything for us here. It's saying stop or auto, so that looks good. I can try Facebook and YouTube. However, they don't seem to be coming around at all. So we'll keep an eye on them and perhaps I will restart the show if they succeed in working. Um, at the moment, they're saying not ready. Um, so please bear with me, those of you who are watching in Cambridge. I've been studying the numbers on our viewers uh, on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, they tend to be in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 to 30 uh, viewers for each show. Um, and that's fine, but we're obviously in a startup pilot mode, and I don't really have any good way of uh, getting numbers back from CCTV on those in Cambridge who are trying, but I know yesterday um, one of my Cambridge uh, friends uh, tried to watch the show and found that the beginning of the show was loaded with noise or static of some kind going on exactly where they came from, I do not know. but. As I explained that yesterday, uh, we had a uh, failure uh, of the uh, recording at YouTube and at Facebook. I talked to the company that makes the modern technology called Core uh, uh, Services from Teradec, wonderful company. I've been using their products for a while. Uh, and they said I needed to restart um, the, um, the, the YouTube and uh, Facebook feeds. So I do think I'm actually recording uh, on um, a tool that they offer to me to record up at their site and let me download the file later. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of that today. But yesterday, um, I called up CCTV and told them I'd had this mistake. My show had not gone out to my regular live viewers. Um, I really don't know how many people watch live. And I might ask, uh, as, I, as I restart this show, which I plan to do in five or ten minutes, um, I will ask them uh, whether they uh, uh, do watch live and contact me and tell me about it. Uh, so let me go over here again and say, it's, it says not ready, not ready. I'm going to crash this uh, particular stream, and I'm going to crash this other one. And then I'm going to find my channels, and I'm going to drag Facebook back into the, um, oh, I've gotten it over there, but it says not ready. And I'm going to do YouTube, move that over here. It is saying ready. Nope, it's saying not ready. 
Facebook is saying ready though, so that's a good sign. And we may want to, now it's announcing that it perhaps is ready. So what I'm going to do, I think at this point, I hope those of you in Cambridge will bear with me as I try to get these technical problems ironed out. I'm going to switch back to my um, title card, which shows the talk today. This is a Tuesday, so it's a free will lecture, and it's on chance. And what I'm going to do now is try to start all, and if it does start, I will uh, play the music. Let's see, start all. So far it's not responding. Not responding. Ready. Connection failed. Connection failed. Okay, it looks like I'm not going to be able to get that show today, and so I will rely on the recording that's going on up at, uh, let me come back to my screen here, <clears throat> rely on the recording that's going on up at Teradac, and I won't have to ask CCTV to download a 2.5 gigabyte file, which we did last night, and then I manually uploaded it to YouTube, and I manly, manually uploaded it to Facebook. So let's see, I'll give this a retry button and another retry button, see if that makes any difference. And if not, we're going to start the show again uh, and do our little talk about, um, let's see, get this little fellow to stay out. And it is saying it's ready, and it's saying go live, and so I can, uh, one is ready, the other is not ready. I'll just click here and put that one away and get back uh, YouTube again, drag the destination into place, and it says not ready. Okay. Um, I'm not sure people in Cambridge would be too interested, uh, but uh, I'm hoping to talk to the people at CCTV uh, because I've come up with a way in which my program or other programs that CCTV might encourage that you other residents who might be interested in having a show like this one might use to, um, uh, these tools I might use to send to other public access stations in our metropolitan area or ideally into a uh, kind of distribution, nationwide distribution to public access stations. Uh, I hope to get that uh, idea out there. And I'm still getting a YouTube is not ready. So I'll drop it in one more time. YouTube, YouTube is ready. Let's click the auto save and once again, we'll try to go live. Start all. Connection failed. Okay. Um, it might it might be uh, useful to use the program this way, but I'm also going to try to just restart it again. So uh, what I am seeing. We'll switch to that title card. Once again, I'll turn on the music. Let it start playing. Hi. I'm Bob Doyle, the Information Philosopher, webcasting to you from my ITV studio here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And here on my big screen, you see today's topic, Chance in Philosophy, Biology, Psychology, and Neuroscience. I want to welcome you and I'm restarting this program. 
uh, because I've, have, I've had trouble starting the YouTube and Facebook streams. I hope to deal with those tonight. And I've chosen on this Free Will Tuesday the subject of chance. And chance is very sketchy sort of uh, word and a concept that has bothered a lot of people through the ages. Uh, from the very earliest days uh, of Greek philosophy, uh, the word chance, uh, the word in uh, Greek is tuke or taiki, sort of written like psuche or psyche, the idea of the mind, um, that word was contrasted with necessity and chance is regarded as the opposite of necessity. So let me bring this to the full screen. And once again, this is my iFi blog, where those of you who want to look into what the show is going to be about ahead of time can take a look at this blog. And I put the title of the lecture of each day. So the date there says today is January 9th, Tuesday. We're on free will. And um, I have uh, noted there that chance is often defined as the opposite of necessity. The English word actually derives from the Latin cadere, uh, and the C-A-D, C-A-D-E, tells us a lot about it. Uh, it means to fall, um, and the noun a cadens is a fall, or a falling. Now, our dictionary definitions uh, on this notion of falling and the cadere refer to the fall of the dice. Um, somehow they think that uh, the die is cast, throwing the die, that was a very important ancient idea, comes down to us, and it somehow being, is connected with the meaning of this word to fall. But if you look into the etymology of the word, it seems to be me to be related to the grammatical idea of a declension. So uh, if you remember your Latin or maybe did Greek or some other language, uh, which has a declension, uh, we have a very few cases left of the number of cases, nominative, genitive, accusative, dative, and so forth. Uh, we still have those, a uh, form of a word that fits to being the, um, a noun of a different kind, but English has lost a good deal of the great uh, languages of the past. Some of the present still have uh, a large number of cases when you decline the verb, uh, the, the noun, uh, you conjugate the verb, you decline the noun. It's, now notice how decline sounds like falling over, right? So cadere is falling over and declining and declension. You fall away from the nominative case, the noun, okay? And then the genitive is slightly falling over, the dative falls a little more, the accusative, and then vocative in Latin, and in Russian we've got an ablative, we've got a couple of other, maybe as many as six or seven cases in ancient languages. Uh, Sanskrit had a good deal, uh, Russian still has quite a large number, and so forth. And the sense of it is uh, that the nominative case is straight up. That's the way it ought to be. And nominative is, is considered to be a positive sort of uh, notion. Uh, nominative, nominally, nomos is uh, the root of the word that means law, uh, one kind of law, and that's the lawful way to work, is speak with the nominative uh, uh, case. And indeed, because of uh, the falling away, uh, the declension of a noun, indicates a falling away from the right, the straight, the nominative path is the good path, and these paths are questionable, and so I think this gives us etymologically a sense of the word uh, telling us that we're not on the straight and narrow, that we're falling over, and we are, uh, one word I suggest, uh, falling in the sense of decadence, okay? And note that I do here that the word in German for chance is zufall, literally to fall, as if chance is a falling. The dice are being thrown in the case of the most famous possibility of what they're talking about uh, as, as they are falling. So in 440 BCE, Leucippus, who was, along with Democritus, one of the great 
uh, philosophers uh, of the uh, view that the world consists of atoms in a void and that the atoms are all somehow material and or maybe mechanical, uh, their vision of the universe was that everything was totally uh, determined. And here I uh, quote uh, Leucippus as what I described, the first dogma of determinism. And that is that nothing occurs by chance. And he used the word maton instead of touke. But, he says, there is a reason, and here he uses the word logos, very important, famous word in all of knowledge and science. All our sciences end with logi, uh, logi, uh, psychology, uh, so biology, and those are logos. Our sciences are lo a logos about the subject. And logos to the Greeks meant many things, wonderful, versatile word, but the principal thing that logos meant was a, an account, a story. Somehow uh, the reasons behind uh, what's going on. Uh, so the word logos comes down to us in a lot of ways. Uh, it some kind just means a simple word in the so-called, uh, in the beginning it was the logos. And, and arche ho logos, uh, that's a, a notion of a story uh, which explains everything and somehow a word summarizes that in the minds of some. Certainly in the minds of the Greeks, logos was a very powerful thing. Famously, Heraclitus, the philosopher of change, as opposed to Parmenides, who was the philosopher of a constant being, an eternal universe in which we lived. And all change, according to Parmenides, was an illusion. There are no changes. Uh, the universe has truths which are eternal truths, and those are the operative what's going on. Anything that looks like change is, again, the Plato, um, an imitation of the real world of ideals and ideas that are out there. Okay, but with this first utterance of uh, what it is uh, from a Greek philosophical perspective is that chance is uh, impossible. Nothing occurs by chance, according to Leucippus. Uh, in instead, he and Democritus thought that everything, including every time a, an atom bumped into another atom, whatever it was going to do was predetermined by the laws of, in those days it wasn't yet called physics, but the natural laws would, uh, would have all of these collisions completely determined by their paths. So nothing accidental would happen. Uh, so to complete the quote from Leucippus, nothing occurs by chance, but there is a reason and a necessity, and necessity, their word is ananke, um, for everything, okay? Now, there's a rich co story coming down from these Greek words and these Greek concepts uh, because I would think for the most part, most of the deep thinkers throughout the ages, and that includes almost all the religious thinkers as well as the philosophical thinkers, they all think that uh, we can say that chance just does not occur uh, because if it did occur, from a religious standpoint, it would threaten the notion of an omniscient and omnipotent God. Um, and all good is often added to that trilogy of attributes to the supreme being who is in charge of everything, knows everything that's going on, knows whether you've been good or bad, as we spoke about recently. That notion, that's incredible notion uh, that all many, so many civilizations have invented through the ages of a supreme being is in real trouble if things are going on in the world that are not just um, not known or not just random but therefore not known by the supreme being. What kind of a world would, what kind of a supreme being would she or he or it or whatever be if things were happening by chance? Down as recently as the 18th century, early 19th century, the very idea of chance, uh, which was uh, written up uh, powerfully in a theory of probability uh, by, uh, oh, I'm failing on his first name, uh, de Moivre, maybe Auguste de Moivre. Let's take a moment and switch screens. Come over here to this screen on chance 
and we see some of the story that I'm, I've got here, but I'm going to open a new window and I'm going to go to Information Philosopher, which is where uh, I guess this one will do. And I want to go down the right hand side and I'm going to, as you see, I'm trying to teach you to do this someday when you want to go and get the references that I've put up for you. So I'm going down the philosophers and I'm wondering whether I put De Moir here or over in um, Scientist because he's a mathematician. I don't see him there. So let's scroll down past all the philosophers, Schopenhauer, Strawson, Williamson, and here we are in Scientist. And here he is. Ah, his first name is Abraham, not August de Marv. But we'll just open up de Marv and we'll see that he's in the 17th century and he wrote a book called The Doctrine of Chances. Now let me just bring that up on this screen and we'll go back here for a moment and uh, focus on Abraham de Marv because he wrote uh, this book as a handbook to be used by gamblers. Uh, and the idea was that every game of chance, okay, um, had a fundamental um, a set of rules of how you play the game, but then given that you followed the rules and given that you threw dice or shuffled cards or whatever you did to make the game uh, a, a level playing field between all the players and introduce elements of chance, the, those elements of chance could be, you, could be calculated uh, to give us your probabilities of winning in any different, in any particular situation. So imagine that we're playing cards and you've got three hearts and two other suits and you wish to get rid of the two and try to draw some more hearts. Um, de Marv was the first one to work out the probabilities that you would succeed if you decided to keep playing in this hand of poker or whatever. Um, now this master of probability and, and de Marv, let's see if I scroll down, I haven't looked at his screen lately, uh, he was the first one to work out the distribution, the distribution of chances. So if you are, are throwing a die in this case, or this actually is uh, flipping a coin. That's he worked out the probabilities for. If you flipped a coin 36 times, I believe, in this chart, then the probability would be that you'd get 50/50 uh, uh, this amount of the time, and then maybe uh, I'm not sure I've got the numbers right here, but. Um, you know, more, more of heads than tails, and more heads, more heads, more heads, and all heads. One chance in 36 of getting all heads, and one chance in 36 only of getting all tails. But mostly, if you threw them large numbers, you'd, you'd wind up getting the 50-50 case, half heads, half tails, is the most probable outcome. So what we're talking, who we're talking about here, uh, Abraham de Moir was the man who gave us this thinking about probability. So it's important that we, um, uh, today we have the so-called normal distribution now where I've made this a smooth uh, function. And uh, it was our Charles Sanders Peirce who described this as normal, it was his choice of word. Uh, and I thought I would have something else in here, I've done a lot about this, I guess that's the end of the page on de Moir. But I thought I had a quote from de Moir on uh, what it is uh, that this, this uh, I see I don't have it here. Uh, basically, de Moir uh, regarded chance, his word, as atheistical. And this probability distribution that we have, uh, this one, let's give one a nice smooth curve on it. Here's a photo of one where we've uh, done 512. Oh, I see, that's an animation. There it is being shown with 16 throws, 32 throws, 64 throws, 128 throws of the dice, 256, and maxes out at 512. Look how wonderfully smooth. And, and de Moir, the mathematician, saw it going over to being smooth. 
and saw that it might be a continuous distribution if you could throw an infinite number of dice and so forth. Uh, we've been dealing with this problem of whether the universe is fundamentally continuous or is it fundamentally made up of discrete objects and it's only when you have a large number of discrete events that it starts to look smooth and continuous. Uh, we can apply this to our uh, case of the two-slit experiment where we're sending particles in one at a time and we start to get the fringes on the back wall. Here we've only throw th four throws, eight throws. You can already see um, that um, they're, they're tending towards more and more continuous as we do in more and more experiments and, or in this case trials they call it in probability. Ultimately, it approaches the um, smooth uh, interference fringes on the back wall as it, that we would get from continuous water waves. Okay, but why did Dumois think this was atheistical? Partly because in his life and times, it was very dangerous to talk about chance because to a religious ear, this was saying that there were things unknown to God. Uh, Dumoiv had a very difficult life. I'm vaguely remembering his biography. He grew up in France and he was a Huguenot, Huguenot who were treated horribly by the Catholic Church in France. So uh, at one time, um, despite doing this spectacular work, uh, Dumoiv um, uh, got published somewhat, I believe, even maybe, maybe while still in France, but then he escaped. He ran to England to avoid the slaughter of some of his uh, co-religionists. And uh, when in England, it turned out, his math was absolutely as good as anyone's at the time. Let's go back to his dates. I think we've got 17th century, uh, 18th century. Um, and uh, I believe I have it right that de Moivre was a contemporary of Isaac Newton. And de Moivre's work came to the attention of Isaac Newton who tried to get him an appointment of some kind in the Royal Society, definitely helped with getting some of his math works pu published. But for the most part, de Marv could only continue to get out more and more editions of this, his The Doctrine of Chances book, which I have a link to it. Uh, there were three editions, it says here, between 1718 and 1756. Um, I think those dates are a little late for Newton, but somehow I believe uh, there was a connection there, but de Marv could never get a post, a, a, a kind of uh, academic post or a professional post in England because he was not uh, the Church of England on the one hand. He was not French, he, uh, not English. The French uh, were not welcome uh, for the most part in Britain in those days. Uh, here, uh, before we leave de Marv, let me add this line because it gets to the heart of everything that we need to know about probability as opposed to statistics, okay? The probability of an event, he wrote, let me bring it to full screen, the probability of an event is greater or less according to the number of chances by which it may happen compared with the whole number of chances by which it may happen or fail. So the bottom line here is that you just simply count the number of ways something can happen. So if you have a die and you throw it, there's six possibilities. Each face has a one-sixth because there are one way to succeed and five to uh, uh, fail. So you add up all the successes and fails, uh, happenings and or non-happenings, and uh, you divide that into the uh, one that you're trying to calculate the probability. If you have two die, two dice, um, there's six ways you can roll the first one and six ways that you could roll the second, and that becomes 36 possibilities. And then you could say, what's the chance of getting a one and a one? And it turns out there's only one way to get one and one, and it's one thirty-sixth. But if you start to calculate the number of ways you can get a seven, there are quite a few ways a one and a six, or a six and a one, two different ways, a two and a five, or a five and a two, two ways there, keep working your way up. Pretty soon you have six uh, different ways, I believe, so you have a one-sixth chance of rolling uh, a seven. Um, and that becomes the most probable 
outcome. Uh, and we can do rolls are called trials and throw dice and look for the chance outcome, count them up. They turn into experimental data that we call statistics. Statistics are experiments that we do in order to see what's happening probabilistically. And probability is a theory about what should happen in the long run if we do a large number of experiments or trials and gather our statistics. The connection between probability as a theory and statistics as experiments is rarely understood clearly, I find, by many people who, who have written on this subject quite well. They have a surprising number of uh, difficulties, uh, I, I should say, to be generous, with the difference between a, um, a probability and, and statistics. Uh, here I pop up on the screen my way of telling you to keep it in mind that uh, probabilities are theories and they are true a priori because they depend only on the mathematical logical possibilities, okay? Possibilities we can count and then we can turn them into probabilities for the different arrangements or different patterns or different ways we can accomplish uh, our ends. That gives us probabilities. Then we can go out and experiment and just perform one trial after another, starting again with the same beginnings and gather statistics. And they're a posteriori, that is to say, after the fact. They are not theories. They are results of experiments. And we can add them up and connect our probabilities for each possibility with the statistics that we get for each uh, possibility. Okay, so let's uh, switch back to our, our blog post today on chance in philosophy, physics, biology, psychology, and neuroscience. And let's um, go past Leucippus and basically point out that chance has been regarded as inconsistent with causal determinism and with any physical or mechanical determinism. Um, and that inconsistency is very important, especially when you think it has religious implications. So the idea that chance and necessity are the only two logical options uh, and that neither is compatible with free will and moral responsibility is the basis for my standard argument against free will. Uh, and this is a Tuesday, so it's a good time to remind ourselves of where I'm going with this. I hope that those of you who listen uh, in the future uh, will take this seriously as something you can explain to others. Because if these are exhaustive uh, logical cases, we can either where everything's necessitated or determined, or everything involves chance and therefore is not determined or what's called indeterministic, okay? If either one of those is true, the argument goes, there's no free will. Because if necessity, everything is necessitated or determined, then we are not free. And if things involve chance, uh, indeterminism, then we can't be responsible for doing something which was a happenstance from chance. And neither one of those is, uh, supports the idea of free will and moral responsibility. Now my whole book, and maybe we can switch back to the subject of this lecture, um, is that uh, it's a scandal in philosophy that um, teachers out there are teaching this idea that, that we have no free will. So the first thinker to suggest a physical explanation for chance in the universe was Epicurus, who's a contemporary of Aristotle's. And um, he found in the writings of Aristotle, and I find and put it on my webpage on Aristotle, uh, writing that argues that chance could be considered a fifth cause. Um, he basically uh, argued for cases in which, uh, Epicurus anyway, uh, argued that there must be times when the normally straight paths of the atoms, the atoms now of the, ma the materialists, uh, Democritus and Leucippus, they were all necessitated. But Epicurus said they might occasionally swerve, the famous swerve, the clinamen, uh, would occasionally mean that the universe uh, was bent away from determinism and that would allow us not to be completely determined but by the mechanical laws that Democritus had put forward along with Leucippus. Now, the Stoics, who were the principal um, 
let's see if I'm on the right screen here, uh, the Stoics, who were the principal opponents of this Epicureanism, and there were a number of reasons for being opposed to Epicurus. Epicurus was a wonderful, very pleasant fellow who enjoyed famously his food and his pleasures of various kind. He never was the hedonist, as he's described in much older history, and even a lot of modern history still portray him as somehow totally uh, a glutton and, uh, you know, not, not moral because he was uh, living his life to excess as they looked at it. Uh, in, 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 in fact, he had a very sort of um, style of life which said nothing to excess. And, uh, and uh, the, the idea of the freedom that he brought into the world with his chance, and that's what he did. He said there is chance, as uh, Aristotle had said a fifth cause, um, that that swerve would not make him swerve, okay? that what that swerve did was open up the possibility of something other than chance controlling things or laws, mechanical deterministic laws controlling things. He very definitely did not think we are all chance or all determined or some combination sort of maybe, but uh, I want you to uh, listen to what, um, for example, um, the, the Roman writer uh, in Latin, Lucretius, uh, who wrote De Rerum Natura, The Nature of Things, uh, he is one, uh, Lucretius is one of our major sources for the work of Epicurus, which is otherwise only a few fragments remain because he was heavily censored. Even in ancient times, people did not want to recopy on the manuscripts of Epicurus because he was under attack from the Stoics. And the Stoics were really a very powerful um, force in, in ancient times. And in general, they had a, a very fine set of their own laws, strict, strict moral laws, but uh, much of it is good. They did a lot of science. They were early thinkers about physics, extending Aristotle and so forth. So the Stoics were okay, but they went overboard when they attacked Epicurean freedoms and Epicurean pleasures. But here is uh, Lucretius, more or less quoting or translating into Latin. And he says, let's bring this up to full screen, if all motion is always one long chain and new motion arises out of the old in order invariable, and if the first beginnings do not make by swerving a beginning of motion such as to break the decrees of fate, that cause may not follow cause from infinity. That would happen, we break that causal chain and then cause may not follow cause from infinity. If, if we can't swerve or break that chain, whence comes this freedom in living creatures all over the earth? Now I think that's a wonderful line and in general, that poem, De Rerum Natura, is most of the wonderful insights into the needs of, of humanity uh, to believe that we have a degree of freedom. Uh, and there's a lot of other wonderful stuff in Lucretius. Now, I want to show, I think, um, prove to you, I hope, by reading Epicurus, the fragments that we have, that he did not say the swerve was directly involved in the decisions so as to make those decisions random. This is a, a critical part of what I call the two-stage model of free will, that the chance part is to open up additional possibilities for consideration, for evaluation, and eventually for a judgment or choice which picks one of them for good reasons. And when it picks them, the fact that the one chosen comes to us by chance, in no way um, causes that action to be irresponsible. Just because something uh, came up as a popped into our mind idea, we have no idea where it came from, but when we evaluate it, it turns out to be a good idea and we decide to act on that good idea. How can these modern philosophers, academics all, and I mean dozens and dozens and dozens, um, with you know at least 20 prominent writers saying that if it was originated in chance, it's sort of born in sin, and there's no way that that can be resp morally responsible. 
Um, <laughs> I find it very surprising. I've been wor thinking about this, and trying to write about this now for uh, 10, 15 years. My book on free will tries to make this case, but I'm fighting a, an uphill battle uh, with my colleagues, most of whom are now in academia and are well published uh, and so forth. Compared to me, I'm an independent scholar, although I have the Harvard uh, faculty appointment because I got my PhD at Harvard. So here I am, I want to defend that Epicurus did not say that a swerve, that is to say a chance, accidental happening, would cause our decision itself to be random. His critics now, ancient and modern, I'm on the wrong screen there, come to this one. His critics have claimed mistakenly that Epicurus did assume one swerve, one decision. You'll see that in the literature about Epicurus. It's a mistake. Some recent philosophers call this the, quote, traditional interpretation of Epicurean free will. But that's a mistake. They were The traditional interpretation of Epicurus is written by his opponents, the Stoics, and others coming down through the ages who tended to want to attack the idea of a freedom that involved anything Epicurean and especially no chance. On the contrary, uh, following Aristotle, I say, Epicurus thought human agents have an autonomous ability, and autonomous is a key word because we are thought to be, he thought us to be agents with our own ability to transcend the necessity and chance of some events. This special ability makes us morally responsible for actions, I want to argue. And I want to argue that he was clearly following Aristotle in finding a third way, a tertium quid, they wrote in those days, beyond necessity, the necessity being Democritus physics, and beyond chance, Epicurus swerved. So Epicurus gave us the swerve, but he didn't make it the source of free will, just the source of freedom, freedom of action overall because the tertium quid, the third possibility, is agent autonomy. And here's a direct quote, uh, partly in English with the key words uh, in Greek, uh, from Epicurus, and this comes from a letter uh, to Menoikios, I'm not sure how to pronounce that exactly, uh, paragraph 133. Epicurus tells us, some things happen of necessity, and his word is ananke, others by chance, here his word is tuke, whereas Leucippus used the word maton. Others through our own agency, and here the Greek is parhemas, literally meaning something like through us. And then another paragraph of great importance. Necessity destroys responsibility and chance is uncertain. This is wonderful. He's got the uh, criticism behind the two-stage model. The criticism, this is the standard argument against uh, free will, that if it's necessity, if it's necessitated, there's no responsibility, and if it's chance, it's uncertain. I guess today we'd make it, if there's necessity, we'd say we're determined and therefore not free. Uh, whereas our own actions, he says in Greek, and this is an English translation, and it is to them that praise and blame naturally attach. Right away, Epicurus is telling us, and these are his words, not uh, those translated into the Greek by Lucretius, uh, that moral responsibility, praise and blame, attached to those actions of ours that are autonomous, par emas in Greek. And for those of you who know some Greek, I put in the original Greek from Epicurus. So, basically, I'm saying that um, the Greeks already had a very good understanding of, of chance and necessity, but some of them, notably Epicurus and also Aristotle, who I find things in his writings which are on my Aristotle webpage, already saw that there are some things which can be up to us. Uh, the par hemas, hemas is us, par is like through, uh, in Aristotle, we find words like um, ephemas, meaning uh, genitively the eph is something like, uh, again, more or less a through us or because of us, I think is the translation. And occasionally he writes en hemas, which is in, is in. And he's saying 
It's in us. It's in us, the cause of our actions, the seat of our actions, the part of our character showing from our actions, which Aristotle is so wonderful at the description of how it is we come to have character. Uh, and it's seen through our actions, through the traces in our brains, minds, whatever the ancient view might have been, that there were marks in our character and some of them were good and some of them were bad and therefore they are either uh, praiseworthy or blameworthy and that's the whole story. But some of those actions, the important ones, came through um, an autonomous act when we are autonomous agents where we are the sole origins of the causes, or the sole cause of our actions because we've uh, had, it's come out of our, our own minds, our own, they don't say minds, but something like it. So in my final paragraph here I say, despite abundant evidence, many philosophers deny that real chance exists. If one single event is determined by chance, some of them write, and Leucippus already worried about that, the world would fall apart, many of them have said through the ages. Because if a single event is determined by chance, then indeterminism would be true. And our modern philosophers, our 20th century logical philosophers, logical positivists and so forth, even the analytic language philosophers that comes in the later Wittgenstein uh, in the middle 20th century, uh, they're very worried about this. And they say this undermines the very possibility of being certain about what we know, certain knowledge would not be certain if chance had been involved. And um, some go to the extreme of saying that chance makes the state of the world totally independent of any earlier states. We'd have a total break, a rupture in what was going on if this one chance event occurred, then all hell breaks loose, so to say. They, who knows where the future is going if it doesn't go according to laws that flow nicely and rationally and continuously and so forth. Abrupt breaks here and there and all, but the whole system would come crashing down. Um, I'm not exaggerating much. I have found these thinkers, written them up on my web page uh, with their own web page in many cases. I've 200 philosophers I've read and analyzed, criticized, and if they're living, I've sent them a copy of that page ask them to make sure it's okay, uh, it's because I know those of you who are reading my web pages and rely on them as your first or supplementary resource about what you know about that thinker, I want those pages to be as accurate as I can make them. I can only do that if I get critical feedback. And I hope you'll help if you see things there that need to be said better. But anyway, some go to the extreme, and let's bring this up. Whoops, I need to bring uh, this one up. Some go to the extreme of saying that chance makes the state of the world totally independent of any earlier states, which is nonsense. But it does clearly show how anxious so many philosophers are about chance. Now I promised I would touch on more than just our original background in chance. Uh, this is our deep early philosophy view of, of chance in the universe. In physics, chance comes in in a very important way only when we get to quantum physics, quantum mechanics, where there is a fundamental uh, inability to predict exactly what is going to happen next uh, in an experiment. All we know is when we make an experiment and the apparatus can distinguish between various possible states then given those possible states, we can give them numbers, names, whatever, we can, using quantum mechanics, calculate the probabilities for each possibility. And then when we do the experiment, just one experiment, it always winds up in one of the possible states that the apparatus can measure. But because we only have a statistical theory, the theory only gives us the probabilities for those states, I shouldn't say always and ever, because there are times when there's only one possible state. Uh, and then we do get that state. Quantum physics can be a, 
a, a, a, not a probable, but a, a guaranteed, a certain outcome in some cases. We know about them, and they are part of the theory. But in normal cases, uh, when you're in an initial state, uh, it said if you're that initial state is what's called an eigenstate, a known possible state. Uh, it turns out in that case, you measure again to see if it's in the same state. It is there. Uh, that's an exception to the rule, which is when we experiment, we get statistical outcomes from a statistical theory because all we have in physics is probability. Now, in biology, uh, although there are many who want a, um, what is it called, uh, uh, not, not uh, Darwinian evolution, but um, uh, a design, intelligent designer behind it all, and a what's called the creationist, right? Evolutionists who are creationists who are convinced that God would have left us, uh, wouldn't have left us with chance outcomes here or there. And you can see right back to the story that uh, Abraham de Marv was worried about offending the religious authorities who thought that chance was atheistical. Bring that down to the current day, and you have a large literature, a lot of people writing a theory of evolution that insists that. It couldn't have been the way Darwin describes it and produced any of the wonderful, endless forms, most wonderful, most beautiful, evolving uh, to what we have. It must be that behind the evolutionary process, there is a, uh, a designer, a creator, uh, and uh, they're very popular. Uh, many states have put them in the schools and tried hard to put them in the schools. There are lawsuits and so forth. It's a kind of sad political past in the last several decades, but that's where we are in our modern understanding of science. So many people are now thinking that a lot of science is fake news and so forth. Uh, that's discouraging. Uh, but uh, the, the, the key role of chance in biology is to allow mutations, allow chance accidental alterations in our genetic code. For example, now whether it exactly how it happens is not too clear. There's a lot of argument, and many proving that trying to prove their own case that they know better than the average scientist or biologist, and that something is happening for other reasons. Those are all worth examining, and we test them, and we will will move with to the one that is the most plausible way to understand what's happening. But but the fact that we have real chance. Um, perhaps as a physical chance as a cosmic ray coming in and damaging the DNA and disrupting the nucleotide sequence, producing a different nucleotide sequence, which implies our DNA contains a vast amount of information about being a human being or being an, an ant or a whale or whatever. All of that code, if it's broken in limited places, uh, could be uh, causing the reading off of the information needed to create our proteins, for example, uh, or the other things that the uh, DNA does when it sends out messages from the nucleus via messenger RNA and goes into our another part of the cell where we have gazillion ribosomes, little factories to turn out proteins. They then become active enzymes, which are the little motors and engines and a lot of other operations that go on inside the cell. You can see that a damage to the original code could lead to damage in a critical function in our body. But imagine this. What if the change actually worked better than the one our, our ancestor species was using? Now we have an improvement. And if that improvement is uh, giving the, the child, these descendants, a better reproductive success, that chance could lead to a new species which is better adapted than the one uh, we had earlier, and so goes evolution. At every step along the way in my information philosophy of biology, uh, we are dependent on information structures which are uh, algorithm-like things coding the behavior of our, our biology, our system, and uh, they are the source of control over the flow of matter which is coming in and being used to rebuild uh, damaged or dead cells with new, better working cells or 
even parts within cells that are worn out, broken, and need to be replaced. This whole maintenance process is something that's done under the aegis of information structures that are overall managing the whole living system that I and you are. Uh, but it all uh, wants no change in order for stability, but those changes that happen, as long as they can be repaired, uh, we're okay. But if they actually make a change, which turns out to be an improvement in the uh, genetic inheritance, uh, that explains the fundamental evolution. Now, psychology, we've sort of, the main thing is how important it plays in a role of human freedom and creativity because um, a chance new idea, and I've had many of them in my life, very lucky to have quite a large number of possible new ways of thinking about things or doing things and building new things. And so I've done a lot of that. I'm building this studio right now, which I hope to talk to you more about in the future, making it reach more people than the uh, few dozens who are watching me now. Uh, creativity depends on new information. New information depends on chance. Because if there weren't possibilities, according to Claude Shannon, who had the theory of communication of information, if there's only one possible message that goes over the channel, no new information comes to the other side. It must be that uh, there are many possibilities, and so when a message comes in, whichever one it is, provides new information. So finally, in neuroscience, I want to point out um, phenomenal role of chance uh, that's there in the child, in, the, in every newborn child as their brain forms. Much of the brain patterns of the neurons and all their connectivity is like any other person. And the neurons uh, that go back for uh, perhaps millennia, uh, certainly millennia, maybe uh, millions or, or tens of millions of years in higher organisms like human beings, but the neocortex, the big frontal area that changed us into sapiens from mere erectus or whatever, the neocortex, which grows for years and really never completes growing in everywhere until one is in the order of 20 some years old, grows in entirely by chance. That is to say, there are some layers within it that have similar looking neurons, and so there's an overall sort of uh, organization. But for the most part, these 10 billion neurons connecting to the other parts of our motor cortex and our sensory cortex and so forth, it grows in randomly, which means to say a young child has a set that's all random and there's no information encoded in it yet in our model, which um, I remind you that Donald Hebb said that those neurons that fire together when they get sensations coming in get wired together. Now, the ones that get wired together are more or less entirely at random to some extent because the neurons, the 10 billion neurons, are connected to each one 10,000 other neurons. So we've got 10,000 times 10 billion possible connections. All of them become particular to the experiences of each individual. And that chance means that we all have different recordings of the experiences out there. We all have similar experiences, you know, a child pl plays with a ball, learns what a ball is, and does something with it. But what that child learns can be somewhat different from what other child's children have with their experiences. That can account for real differences that philosophers have worried about for ages in what are called qualia. What does it like to be a bat, some wrote. What is it that my experience of red is when I see red, is it the same as your experience? Well, much of it, the answer is yes, but the possibility of differences is built into human beings because the brain got itself wired up initially, grew out at random to these 10 billion neurons, and then only the ones that get fired and burned in are preserved, and the rest we lose by uh, pruning away uh, ones that don't get used. So. I want to thank you very much for being with us a lecture today. Uh, let me take back this uh, screen describing our lecture and turn on the music. And I will say uh, goodbye until tomorrow.